Hello everyone and welcome to my UDK tutorial series. In this particular episode I'm going to be going over Kismet, the built-in UDK sort of um, scripter event maker thingamajigger. Now it's not the typical sort of uh, programming system you would think of when you, you think of programming, you know, typing out lines and lines and lines of code. No, it's completely visual and I'll show you in a minute, but don't leave right now thinking that you're going to be doing lines of code here in a minute you're not trust me um, it's it's very simple to understand now I kind of went ahead and set up a, a little map thing kind of demonstrate a little kismet uh, pretty pretty simple kismet event that you can do that it's rather interesting and allows you to do some pretty powerful things if applied to larger things than what I have right here very simply but anyway um, and real quick before we get started, I do apologize for not having gotten a video up in a while. I've been busy with school and many other things, and I haven't gotten a chance. And so I do apologize for that. I'm not stopping the series. I It just took me a while to get a video up. Um, so anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and hit play here so you can kind of see what we're doing. Let me jump in here. Now the lighting is kind of messed up and the door is all funky because I just didn't want to fiddle with the level for too long. I already spent like an hour or so on just this. I didn't want to spend too long creating a really pretty looking level for tutorial because then I would never get to the tutorial part. So um, Now if you remember from the cinematic video that we did, we, we kind of set like it down a trigger thing. And I want to be talking about triggers because I said in that video that I was going to talk about triggers in a later video, and this is this that video. I'm going to talk about the trigger thing. But we set it up so if we walked up to the door, it would automatically open for us. However, that is not the case right now. We cannot walk up to the door and it automatically open. So we have to go over here to the control panel and hit E. However, we must have a key to operate the door. We can hit this as many times as we want to, and it will say the same thing. So luckily for us, the key is right over here. We can hit E pick it up once we're close enough and bring it over here hit E there we go done so that's that nothing too fancy but you can really get uh, you you can make it fancy using you know the cinematic editor you can do stuff with like lights and turning on lights when you hit certain buttons and all this kind of fancy stuff so um, let me go ahead and pull up the kismet window uh, if I hit the K button right here I like to think of it the K button. Uh, here we go. So, let me just, uh, there, you know, that opens that. I had this on the other monitor, so it was kind of being a little derpy, but, um, okay. So, here we have upset the, the Kismet system. Now, I will come back to this, actually. Um, okay, so I'll come back to this because, you know, I don't want to just be bombarding you with, all this information about what this all does. I want to kind of start fresh and anew. And then I'll come back and explain this. Alright, so first off, the Kismet GUI. Pretty simple. Uh, we have the window button here, which toggles the properties and the sequences. So, there you go. Um, I'm just going to leave up the properties for now. The sequences is not that important. Now, these buttons right here allow you to navigate through sequences, which a sequence is really just kind of like um, a set of scripted events. So if we kind of zoom out here, you can kind of see we have essentially an outline of an area that we can put stuff in. So if we fill up this area, we can create new sequences. Um, and you wouldn't be surprised how easy it would be to do this, especially if you're trying to make things organized. So anyway, um, now of course this goes back to the parent sequence. Uh, these just allow us to kind of bookmark different things and go to them. Um, the, the different sequences and stuff. Uh, now we have rename sequence, zoom to fit, so that kind of just obviously does that. Um, sh hide unused connectors, now I'll just do this. So see how these have nothing you know connected to them? We can just kind of click this and it'll go. And then we can click this other one. And if you, get it a, if you give it a second, it has to kind of update and there we go. Um, so we can do new sequence object, uh, search tool, update list, uh, new window. 
which essentially just gives us uh, a copy of the old window so we can have like you know stuff on multiple monitors if we want to um, and then clear all breakpoints so pretty simple stuff now to move around you can hold the left mouse button drag it around right mouse button works as well uh, zooming is with the mouse wheel and if you hold the both both the left and the right mouse button you can zoom with uh, the mouse this you know kind of this way but I just prefer the mouse wheel of course that's useful if you know if you have like a laptop or something now um, to get started you just need to right click and you can just kind of pick stuff from there so you right click and you have these different options now for the cinematics I just said you know go with a new matinee and you're good nothing else you need to worry about but we are now going to be expanding upon a lot of things so you obviously have your your different categories and it, it can kind of be tricky to remember where everything is um, it can be quite difficult where everything is but once you start using kismet you can kind of really learn the layout um, of of how things are organized and it, it isn't too hard to start um, memorizing so uh, let's see what do we want to do new events hmm. I don't know level loaded so we can click that and now we get this little node thing it's, we have level loaded loaded and now we have a quite a couple different options right so because this is like in, in what was it under new event yeah so this is an event so basically what this is saying is that whenever this happens we're going to send out a signal and that's the way you want to think about kismet it's you're sending and receiving signals um, so whenever the level is loaded, we're going to send out a signal on three points. Loaded invisible, the beginning of the level, and when the level is reset. We're going to send out a signal one time. We're only going to send one signal at a time on, one, on each of these simultaneously, but we're only going to send one signal on each of these. Now, we don't, we, we don't have to have anything on each of these. We could just have nothing there, and it would just end, and the signal would be lost which is okay it's fine but you could connect something to this so we could do new action we could go to um, let's see where is it sound apply or play sound right so we do this and when the level is loaded and visible we want to play a sound so we have this little we can just kind of click and drag and you can connect this to as many things as you want to. Um, and it will just send out one signal. And I know I said one signal, but basically kind of what you... The way I like to think about it anyway is it will send out, you know, if you have these multiple connections, it will it'll send out here and then duplicate. One will go here, one will go here. But you still only have one. It doesn't send out like two or three and hit it two or three times. It's only going to, you know, just play one time. And that's kind of important to, to grasp so that you can kind of see how everything is flowing because if you're getting more than one signal you know hitting things it's going to drastically change how your your kismet uh, system is working um, so anyway um, now you can like right click on these little nodes and you get little options you know break links uh, you can copy connections cut connections and you can also toggle um, delays so you can set a delay on here so if you wanted to wait like 10 seconds after the, the level's visible, you know, so it's loaded, the level's visible, the players kind of, you know, grab the keyboard, you know, it's been saying loading, 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 okay, the level pops up and the player's like, okay, uh, time to play, you know, they kind of get their hands where it's supposed to be and kind of start moving around a little bit, and then you start playing sounds, you could do that. Um, now you could also set the, the delay here, but it doesn't really matter where you set the delay. Um, you, you could you know what you could do is you set the delay here so basically the signal is delayed from ever leaving here um, so basically if I yeah let, let me actually do this real quick let me just do this and so if I had this it's going to go okay levels load invisible go wait five seconds do 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 and go here and go here now instead if I whoops If I keep removing these, if I set the delay maybe just here, right? 
it's going to go loaded level invisible da, boom boom going to go ahead and stop the sound and then it's going to play the sound after five seconds okay so you 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 can kind of do some interesting things with these delays and in depending on where you have it like a lot of the time if we just had this it wouldn't matter where you put the delay it, you would still get a five second delay but whenever you're wanting to you know kind of do where you have multiple things coming out of just one then it kind of starts mattering where you put the delay because it's it's all in order of the lines it, the lines are not just visual visual they do mean something it's starting here and heading this way so if it hits a delay along anywhere along that path it'll delay at that specific point um, now obviously you know we have quite a few things on this play sound node but it it's really not too hard obviously you know we have the play which is just going to play whatever sound you you want to and the stop so we can actually stop the sound in the middle of playing it if we you know have some kind of but you know maybe we have a radio or something when you hit a button on you know you you go up and interact with the radio it plays the sound well maybe if you interact with it again it turns the sound off it's pretty simple to do and you know you just have it toggle it you know go on one to one you know one of these goes to play the other goes to stop pretty simple and uh, well I mean it's a little more involved in that because you you having to get input from the keyboard you know obviously but anyway um, now there's target right here this is where we kinda have to start importing other things in here because if you if I kinda go back over here you can see I've got like these uh, these purple things right here and these triggers we don't have any of those by default you know we can just do actions variables events conditions and that kind of thing now you can see when I've right clicked we have new object variable and new event using that but what we what we can do is we can go out here whoops we can go click on anything in the level and create a kismet link to that so if you remember from the cinematic tutorial we we kind of clicked on a, a trigger and put it into kismet and set it up really quick but I didn't really talk much about it well now now I'm going to so if we go over here and click on this trigger right here and just have it selected we can right click in here and we can do we can either make a variable out of it to use or we can make an event out of it so I'm going to say when this is used right okay so we've got this in here when it's used um, oh by the way if you have your if you're kinda like clicking on something like this hold control it allow you to move these because otherwise you're just gonna be moving this around but hold control and it'll keep the camera still and you can just move this around and you can do that with uh, you you can actually hold can well, no darn it stupid okay stop it I'm trying to there's a button that there okay that that's what I was missing if you hold control and alt and then you can drag like this to select multiple things and you can move multiple things at a time I did forget to mention that there we go so control and alt you know to do this and select multiple things but anyway uh, back to the trigger so we have two things coming off of this used and unused now notice we can't plug this into the level loaded because the level loaded is an event the the like events are the beginning of your your of of what's ever happening of whatever is happening pretty um most variables most um actions most pretty much everything except events are going to have an output slot so you can just keep continuing the chain for as long as you want to however events obviously are going to only have outputs but no inputs okay so and these are are they they are they don't have these shapes for reason these shapes represent what they are you know so this is an action these are um, events and the colors kind of can come into play too so you can kind of differentiate you know things by looking at the colors and the shapes of things um, but anyway so we can we can use this trigger now now that we've imported in here we can you know say whenever this trigger is used do something um, if it's not used, do something else. So, you know, maybe we can have it, 
um, we can have something playing a sound as long as the trigger is not used. But if the trigger is used, we stop the sound. So instead of playing a sound once, you know, like you go up to a radio and the radio is already playing in the level. But whenever you click on it, you know, you're using it, it stops the sound, right? But when it's not used, you play the sound. So we, we could do something like this. You could do, let's, uh, don't want to delay there, but we'll get rid of that in a minute. Set active delay, zero. So, no, whoops. So use, stop, unused, play. And there you go. Um, now that should work. I mean, it, it would probably require a little bit more tweaking. I'm not, I'm not saying that this would work automatically because the unused can be a little finicky with how that exactly is defined. But at any rate, there you go. Um, so we can, we can import pretty much anything we want into Kismet to use as an, as an object. So we could actually go ahead and go in here. Use, you know, like I could select this rock right here. Go into here and do new object variable and drag this down here and point this to there. And there we go. We've just dragged that rock into Kismet. Now, you're probably asking, okay, what does this specific thing do? But whenever this is looking for a target, in the case of the sound, it is looking for an origin point for the sound. If I didn't give it one, it would just kind of play through your speakers on Com, you know, completely balanced, and it, it would seem like it's really not coming from anywhere, like music, you know, like when music is just playing in the background, it's kind of balanced on both sides usually, and it's just kind of playing in the background from no real source, but if I, if I plug this rock into it, now it would make the sound appear to be coming from the rock. It has an origin point, right? So, we could actually put more than one thing in there, okay, but... Y you can just kind of see how, how we can just drag whatever we want and put in there. Now, you want to be a little careful th with this because the same rules apply with the, the cinematic stuff where you can't use static meshes for things where you have to be directly um, moving an object. So if you, if you wanted to, like, delete, some, delete a mesh out of the world, you couldn't do that with a static mesh. You would have to use an interp actor to be able to allow it to interact with Kismin in a lot of ways. So... Just keep that in mind. Like, if something is not working for you in Kismet, you have everything set up right, and you're just like, I don't understand why this isn't working, try making sure that any static meshes that you have um, are set to interp actors, because that will matter greatly. Of course, don't go setting all of your static meshes to interp actors, because again, setting it to an interp actor is giving it extra code to be able to deal with these interactions with it, with Kismet and the Matinee Editor. So setting all of your static meshes to um, to um, interp actors is just going to give more RAM to your game, and you don't want that. So <clears throat> anyway, now that is that's that's pretty much all there is really is to know about. Um, how Kismet works itself, the rest is just kind of putting things together and kind of showing kind of how to create flow with combining all of these things together. Now, there is, of course, the properties window, which you've seen a couple times as I've been clicking on it and then clicking off of it. Uh, this is specific This is specific to every single um, object, uh, event, tr you know, trigger, or whatever. So yeah, I'm not going to show you all of them, but basically this is where you you know you would set the sound to actually play. I go into the content browser, select something, hit the little green arrow. There we go. Now you know I can I can add extra delay. So you can have a lot of different places to put delay in some places. So I can add a little extra delay on the actual sound beginning. I can add fade in time, fade out time. So this is great for you know music stuff at the beginning of a level. Um, volume. Uh, before end time, suppress subtitles, uh, targets. Now, um, if you want, you know, you want to. Uh, so, a list of objects to call the handler function on. So that's that's more specific actual programming stuff. So there there is some programming stuff tied into this, but you don't have to be you know 
a, a major UDK programmer to be able to use this stuff. Now the object comment, if I do um, plays a sound from the con browser, this is really just kind of a way for you as a user well, not as a user, but you um, as the level designer or whatever to know what this does, right? Now you can also do this. You can hit this check mark, and whenever this is activated in any way, if it's stopped, if it's played, if there is an in, like basically, if I have a connection that is importing into this and this gets activated somehow. It will display this to um, to the screen, which is how I got my um, my um, my messages to display. Now, of course, there's some there's a lot of things you know having to do with this depending on the type of game mode you're in or whatever because of the way you UDK is set up with the default um, Unreal Tournament stuff. But that that it's for another day. Essentially, you um, you can have it display a message this way. So now, I mean, there there is an actual, you know, uh, uh, let me see, where is it at? Um, there is an actual announcement thing that we can do, but I'm just I'm just saying, you know, there's another uh, a way to do it that way if you wanted to kind of kill two birds with one stone. So let's go ahead and delete all this stuff and head on over here. All right. So what we have here is we have two triggers okay so we have trigger one is the console so this is what's going to be activating our door oh wait no I'm sorry trigger one is this one my bad I got the I got them backwards this is trigger one and to verify yes trigger one so this is what's going to be detecting whether or not we've actually picked up the key. Now, in the meantime, we have trigger zero over here detecting whether or not we... Um, well, I mean, it's detecting whether or not we've got the key, but it also activates the animation based off of kind of what this trigger is saying, sort of. Um, so they, they, they both detect whether the player has the key. But anyway, um, so what what we're doing essentially is we we've got them set to use okay and the default key for that by the way is e there's plenty of tutorials out there to go that go into you know how to change the hot hot keys and stuff of playing in the game you have to go in like change i and i files in udk um and changing files and stuff like that i'm like i'm just going to leave it as e cuz i don't really care um but anyway so we if you go in here let me bring up the prop uh, no properties menu so we I don't have aim to interact on but I have the object comment and then print that to the screen okay now I have the trigger count set to zero which means infinite so that's I was able to kind of sit there and just keep clicking at it or hitting the E key as many times as I wanted to because it's set to an infinite number of times now I could set this to two so I I would only be able to hit it two times and after that it would not work anymore so I, you know you can do that on your own judgment if you want to do that um, and also the the trigger delay is kind of important because if I set this to like one second I could hit E um, to activate it and it would give me the message and do everything it needs to do um, but then afterwards I wouldn't be able to hit E again and do anything with it until that one second has passed and then it will be available for doing things with again. Um, now technically this one could be set to one because this is the thing that is we are picking up the key with so I don't really need to activate it again I just need to activate it one time and then we're good. This is the one that you need to make sure that you have set to zero which is the um, console thing. Now what we're doing okay is we are we have a bool and a bool is just a true or false value and we we have it set to false false being that we're 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 saying we're asking the question essentially this 
how to think about it. We're asking the question, does the player have the key in, in, in its inventory? Or in his inventory, his or her inventory? And by default, this the answer to this is no. So that is what this false right here is. This false is we 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 all we have okay is just a variable bool, and we just named it okay. So we have this new bool variable that I drag in here, and I'm actually going to put the sequences thing back in there because I'm used to that being there, so it's a little long. All right, so we have the the bool value is zero, zero being false, one being true, okay. Um, zero for off one for on kind of thing like that and we just have it key okay so that's the exact same thing we just called it something all right that's all we did we just named it something and we named it key you could name this horse if you wanted to it doesn't matter what you want to call it you just you know, name it something that you can keep track of what this is representing so we we named it something and we just have this being set to false by default now what this is doing is that whenever we we use the trigger we're essentially we're going to be like right on top of this so we have to be within this radius to use it okay so we, you know we have to get up close and then we use the trigger and it's going to send out a single input into this now the first thing that's happening with this bool and, and it can kind of look confusing because it's like okay value and target and all this kind of stuff but all that's really happening is it's looking for a value to set to. So we want to set it to true that does because we're asking the question, does the player have the key in their inventory? By default this is no. However, the player just used the trigger which is next to the key, so they're essentially picking up the key. So now the player does have the key in their inventory. So we want to say yes, the player has their key in the in the inventory, so it's true. So value is the value is now true. The target is the key variable. Now this is kind of where it's kind of important. Now this is not a bool. This is a bool, but it has no name associated with it. It's just a bool. If we name this, it wouldn't work because um, the named bool variables or the named variables like that are associating you so you can use them later on so you know so we're, we're changing that specific variable this is just saying that we want to set it to true um, hopefully that makes sense but what we did is we went to variable um, and named variable and what we did is we we went you know expected type is bool and find variable name key capital K key so it's it's going to look for this right here and once it finds this it says okay check mark I know what this variable is now so we can now essentially what what this allows us to do is we can have a default value and then we can change we can change this this right here to true and false or whatever we want and then we can also retrieve that information of whether or not that right I'm I keep for like I'm pointing at the screen and that's not helping anyone except making myself look retarded but um, it allows us to have this variable right here um, be changed to true be changed to false be changed to true you know and so on and so forth and then we can retrieve the value from this so it's kind of a three-step process, but anyway, that, that's kind of how that works. So we have to set the initial variable with a name. Now this is not a this is not a name variable. Remember, it's just a bool, but it has a name associated with it. This is a specific named variable. Um, now this doesn't have to be a bool. We, you know, we could set this to expected type of anything else we want it. But we're just looking for a bool. And so, you know, we find it and then we're good. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, I want this, whenever I receive a signal in the input, I want to set the key variable to true. And then I'm going to go to something else. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually destroy the key. Because if you're going to be picking up the key, the key is no longer going to be there. So we want to just go ahead and destroy the mesh. Now notice this says interp actor. I made it, 
I was actually whenever I was testing this to make sure it was working. Uh, everything ex everything was working fine except the key wasn't disappearing because I had it set to a static mesh. So it wasn't giving me like an error. It was just it was it was just trying to destroy the key, but it wasn't able to because it was a static mesh. So this is what I was saying earlier. You need to make sure that you have um, what needs to be set to an interp actor set to an interp actor so that you can. Uh, um, inter interact with it and uh, do things to the mesh that like you know moving it or in this case completely deleting it and this is not just hiding it like I'm literally going over to the mesh and hitting the delete key so it's no longer there it's not loaded it, it's there's no code well there's technically code for it but it's not loaded anymore in the memory of the world. Now there is an option to just temporarily hide the mesh if we wanted to bring it back in later. But th in this case, we're we're literally deleting it, and we it, there, there's no there's no way to get it back after we've done this. Of course, it you know we could go out here and we could see that it's there because it's only being deleted under a scripted event. But anyway, um, so then then we're pretty much done at this point. All right. Where where some of the other work comes in is detecting whether or not we've actually ha we actually have the key. So th whenever this trigger is used, it gives an input into a compare bool. Now this is going to the bool section is looking for this. So it's it's looking to see what the value of this key is. And it's going to be a true or it's going to be a false value. So, you know, we, we only, we're only looking at the true. If, if it's false, we're not going to do anything. Because now we could set this up so that if we already grab the key before going to the console, it wouldn't give us this message where we have to have a key to open the door. So we could just go to new action, um, voice announcement, play announcement, and we could do false in and we could just set an announcement to play here that you know you must have a key to open the door kind of thing like that if we wanted to do that but I'm just like you know what we'll just do it this way it'll just play every time so but what but if we do have the key if this value is true because we're only setting it to true whenever this is activated so if that is true then we play an animation and there we go. So that's kind of how that whole thing works. It's pretty simple when you get down to it and you understand it. It's really simple. But um, it it can really easily be made much more complicated, much more in-depth. Um, and you can do some really neat things just with a, a simple... Um, a simple little example like this. And I know that this is not going to say, okay, well, what do I do with the other variables? But hopefully is kind of giving you enough information to go from here and knowing how this kind of stuff plays together and works together um, you can do some stuff so I mean if I go over here and if I do new variable float this is going to be just a decimal number so I can I can set this decimal number to things and it literally works the exact same way as the bool except instead of a true or false value it's just number values so you know obviously if we're doing we can't do a compare bool on it we have to do uh, conditional um, well you know we'd have to do comparison yeah here we go compare float so we have you know it looks a little different but this is just essentially saying um, we, we'd have to have two of these so we'd have to have two floats so if we do um, new variable random float sure why not so this will essentially be a random number right so we have zero and then this is just going to be a random number it's going to give us a random number every time we hook this in here we activate it you know like this so if I hit this button it's going to um, see which one of these and if a this is a this is B so if a is less than or equal to B we do something here. If A is greater than B, we do this. If A equals B, we do this. If, or no, that's A is greater. So if A is less than B, we do this. And if A is greater than or equal to B, we do this. And that's that's basically how that works, right? 
So it, you know, it's it's pretty simple to kind of go through this and figure things out. And I know I'm not explaining, you know, how to do this, but you know, we 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 would just set this to a variable name like we did over here. We would just do the exact same thing. We could do, you know, a bool um, thing. We do event or uh, variable. Let's see. Um, set variable float. And um, let me see. So we can set the variable float. And the target is going to be just like this. It's going to be a named variable. And then, you know, it, so it works the exact same. It's just working with numbers instead of a true or false value. Um, so, you know, you can do things based off of a random number. Like, you know, a player uses something like a slot machine. You know, you could have a slot machine mesh or something. You create an animation for it, you know, to do, you know, to be displaying things. Um, and you have, and you generate a random number to tell the player whether or not they've won a prize. And, you know, you could literally do that here in Kismet, and it wouldn't be, you wouldn't have to do any external programming. Um, now, you know, you could do new condition is, is alive. If the player is alive, and you could check, see, if, if you're on multiplayer, you could just check certain players. You don't have to check all the players in this case. So you could just check certain players. Now, of course, if you're in single player, um, there is a there's a player variable. So you just drag that in here. You could do all players. Now you could go down here to the options and adjust um, which player you want um, and all that kind of stuff. But essentially, you could just do all players. And if the players are alive, do something. If the players are all dead, do something else. You know, like you've lost the game, you've won the game, kind of thing like that. Um, so that's that's another example of stuff you can do. So really it's just up to kind of sitting down saying, okay, what is it that I actually want to do? And, you know, you, you think of something, okay, whenever the player inserts the battery into the generator, the light comes on, blinks a couple times, and then the elevator starts running. And a message pops up onto the screen. The elevator is now working again. You may proceed to the next level. Okay, and you say, okay, first things first, I want the player to be able to pick up the battery. So you create a trigger used. You, 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 want, you, know, you want the player to be able to use the trigger. So then you just set up essentially this right here, pretty much the exact same. Um, and then you, you, know, you go over to the generator. You do something almost exact same similar to here you just don't have the animation well no you would have the animation but the animation would be applied to the lights flickering um, and then the elevator coming on and then whenever the animation is completed you just have it play something there so it that that's how that would work and then you could actually just continue on um, load a new level from there and and continue on from that um, now, I, I do want to say one thing about animation, um, the the matinee thing. It, it can be a little kind of complicated whenever you're, because you, you've got like a lot of different inputs here. So, say this were false, we didn't have the key, we could actually have the doors reverse their, anim their, their actual animation, which would have them... It would just play the whole thing backwards, so the doors would actually f teleport to being open and then close. So, you know, sometimes you want to make, you, you can actually make your uh, your matinee sequences in a way that they can be played forward or backwards, but depending on what direction they're played, they kind of give you a different result. It may kind of sound confusing, but if you do it right, then it, you know, you can make it work. Um... And there's actually a couple options whenever you're doing sounds that if they're you can have them being played backwards instead of being played forwards, so that the sounds um, will also match up. But you know you can you can have uh, and and keep in mind whenever the matinee is playing, other things can be going on in the level. So you could have just a light flickering in the background as a matinee sequence just being repeated over and over and over again. Because you can actually do this. Ready? Um, let me... New action. Level. 
event actually is what I needed. Level loaded. Loaded invisible play break all links. Loaded invisible play completed play. Now the matinee sequence will loop infinitely. Whenever the level starts up, it will just loop infinitely. The door will open, then teleport to the closed position, then open and teleport to the closed position, and keep doing that. I'll, actually, I'll go in and show you real quick so you, you know I'm not just making this up. So there it's opening, and once it's finished, it should... Yeah. So it's just kind of completely glitching out now. Um, and it, I don't, it wasn't actually doing the animation, probably because I did something wrong in the creation of this, but, um, at any rate, it, 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 it's glitching out, but you, I mean, this is a very bad way to do it, uh, but you, you can set it up in a much better way, where it just kind of infinitely repeats itself, nice, you know, it gives it time to reset itself, but, you know, you can have like a, a light just kind of blinking in the background and you can walk around and do other things which is where the stop or the change direction comes in so for instance you know a door is opening but the player or the door a door is closing and the player gets squished and dies you have a variable to check whether the player is dead or not if the player is dead you change direction on the doors for you know obviously it's too late at that point but there's an example so the matinees the matinees are very versatile. Uh, you can do a lot with them. Uh, and you just want to make sure that you, you're doing this right. Because you could do completed, go to something else, and then kind of loop back. You know, you could reverse after this. You could, you know, or, or rather do that. So you could, re you could play it and then reverse it. And then if it's reversed, it's going to do this. So it's not going to go to the completed if it's reversed. Now that's another thing because this has two outputs. So if you just play it normally, it's going to go to the completed node. If you reverse it, it's going to go to the reverse node. That's pretty self-explanatory, I know, but I just want to, you know, make sure that that's that 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 is out there. Now, the the stop and the pause, I believe, default to completed. Um, the change direction. I'm not exactly sure if that takes into consideration if you were already reversing it, then it goes to completed, um, or if you were completing it, it goes reversed. I think it just defaults to completed. Um, not quite sure in that one. I haven't used that one very much, but um, that that's that. So um, that's about it for the Kismet tutorial. Hopefully, this made sense. If not, let me know. You know what I could. Uh, what I could change, kind of make it better, because uh, I, I mean, I want to try to m make good tutorials where everybody understands everything. So if you, if you really think it wasn't all that great, let me know what I could do better, and I'll m remake the video, because um, I want to, I want to keep the map. I'm not going to delete it, so I can just kind of redo that. But at any rate, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in another video.